Good afternoon. Welcome back. So uh, the CDC, the U.S. CDC, said yesterday, we are asking the American public to prepare for the expectation that this might be bad. Uh, let's take a look at the numbers. So the ch outbreak in China is definitely leveling off. It's not zero. But if you look at the number of daily cases, which is this, I know it's hard to see, sorry. Uh, the red bars, that's the cases daily. So that's gone way down. So they seem to have it under control, as long as you, as long as you believe the numbers, of course. But other parts of the world now are starting to build up cases, and that's where the CDC concern comes from. Look at South Korea, 1,200, big outbreak in Italy, Japan, Iran, and a bunch of new countries where it hasn't been before. So traveling is seeding this. People aren't very sick, and they are bringing virus with them, and there's no way to stop that. Now, so far this season, we've had 15 million cases of influenza. So just put that in perspective. Nobody is worried about a flu pandemic, right? No, because they're used to flu. They're worried about a pandemic of this new virus, which 80% of cases are mild. Just remember that. But I'm worried about something else. Well, first of all, Trump was in India yesterday. He said, I think it's going to work out just fine. <laughs> he said, when the warm weather comes, the virus will go away. Uh, the, uh, the, the administration, someone in the administration did a press con. Oh, Homeland Security Secretary struggled yesterday to ask, answer basic questions about the virus, which you could probably answer by now. And his acting deputy has been asking around for information on Twitter. In 2018, Trump fired the entire pandemic response chain of command that Obama's administration had put in to address the Ebola outbreak. This means there's no bureaucracy to coordinate federal agencies and responses if we have a, a big outbreak. And last year, he shut down PREDICT, which was a funded program to track and study pandemics, get viruses and study them. This Basically, this administration has made us less prepared for a pandemic than we ever have been. And I don't like to get political, but when it comes to science, I get political because we're, this is ridiculous. You know, everything is denigrated except what drives the economy in this administration. And we're neglecting science. I, don't, I hope we don't have a bad outbreak. I think it might be OK. But if we do, I'm afraid people will die because of the neglect. Now, China had 80,000 cases, and they restricted travel extensively. We're not going to restrict any travel in this country. Uh, so the CDC has said you shouldn't go to South Korea and be careful about Iran so far. But within the US, I don't think there'll be restrictions. If someone comes in and gets sick, they will probably be quarantined. So I just don't know how much it will spread based on that. I think, I'm assuming it's going to come in at some point. We only had 50 cases, 59 cases so far. I assume because it's entering other countries, it's going to enter here. So in the next weeks, we're going to see more cases. No, you're not going to get sick. You, you're all fine. If you're under 60, you're probably going to be OK. And I'll be OK, too, because I know viruses, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm over 60. Not afraid of it. I'm afraid for older people who have health conditions that might get sick. But again, there have been 8,000 flu deaths this year in the US alone. And nobody talks about that. Nobody, the news doesn't even mention it. I don't get it. It's just that this is an unknown quantity, I suppose. All right, so we continue with our replication cycle. We're going to talk about assembly today. This is really the last step in the cycle, and then next time we're going to talk about, we're going to take an overview of the infected cell, all the things that go on at once, changes in metabolism and translation and so forth, and then we'll start talking about how viruses cause disease, basics, and that, that'll be, I think that'll be relevant to the current outbreak, and one of our lectures is about emerging viruses, and that we will focus a lot on the, the new one. But today, uh, to the nuts and bolts. Now, if we've looked at lots of pictures of um, viruses over the past weeks, and in, now you can see, you can put them in classes, more or less. You know, they're, they're icosahedral, like the Picorna viruses. They're, they're icosahedral with envelopes, like the Hepatna viruses, or they have uh, helical nucleocapsids with envelopes. And then they're the complex ones, which <laughs> put separately, and we don't really discuss today. These two classes, you're going to see they assemble in common ways. So just as we use the structure to try and understand how they're built, we're going to use it to see how they're assembled. 
And all viruses go through the similar set of pathway for assembly. And we're talking about building new virus particles. You know the principles of a particle, the helical and the icosahedral symmetry. Now we're gonna see how they're put together from protein subunits. So we start with formation of the individual proteins and eventually the structural unit, right? Sometimes they're multiple subunits for structural unit. Uh, we assemble the shell. And for some viruses, there's no shell. We go right to packaging of the nucleic acid. We cover the nucleic acid in protein to make a nucleocapsid. And for some viruses, then, they acquire an envelope. And we'll see the process by which that works today. Uh, and they're released from the host cell. If it's a naked icosahedral particle, they just continue to release from the packaging. Some viruses actually mature after they're released from the cell. Um, Many mature within the cell or at budding, the step where the envelopes are acquired, and some mature afterwards. That's why this maturation is shown here uh, after release. And then, of course, you go on to infect the new cell. So this last step, this, these two arrows, release from the host cell, maturation to infecting, this is what drives virus evolution. That's it, to find a new host, because if this step isn't achieved, finding a new host, that's it for that virus. And everything, all the ways that viruses change depends on that. The new coronavirus, if you look at all the sequences that have been archived, and you can find them easily. Very little genetic variation. This virus is perfect at finding a new host already. Probably did it in an animal years ago. So there's no need for it to change. It, it transmits beautifully, and that is, in my opinion, and many virologists, that is the driving selective evolutionary force. Obviously, virus particles depend on host shell machinery, although, in some cases, you can produce a single protein, and it will fold and make a virus particle, and some of our vaccines are based on that. Uh, the papillomavirus vaccines, the hepatitis B virus vaccine, we can produce a single protein in, say, a yeast, and it will fold into a virus particle. But for most viruses, we need cell machinery because the particles have to get from one place to another. We need chaperones to help the proteins fold, transport systems to move them around. Many viruses need the secretory pathway to transport to the membrane and bud, and then nuclear import and export machinery. And these re reproduction cycles that we've been looking at are full of these pathways that are needed from the cell. And I, I want to remind you again, today we're going to be looking at a few of these, and I never show you the packed cytosol, but remember, it's really packed full of molecules. Things don't diffuse. There are always microtubules and, and microfilaments involved in the movement of viruses and subviral particles within cells. And, and so that's the theme of this slide, moving in heavy traffic. Things do not simply diffuse and here we're looking at both short and long distance movement in the cell. Short, short distance movement can involve, uh, we're talking about angstroms to nanometers here, pores and membranes uh, like that one shown here that helps to transport uh, viruses and subviral particles. This could be at the plasma membrane or the nuclear membrane. And then long distance. We typically uh, use motor proteins on cytoskeletal tracts. Right, going from the plasma membrane to the nucleus or back from the nucleus to the plasma membrane on the way out is always going to involve motors and microtubules. But again, I leave them out of most of the pictures for simplicity. On the right there is an experiment. A drug is used to disrupt the microtubule network of a cell. So on the top is a, a nice microtubule network. Uh, and this green color is the VSV nucleoprotein, which is coding the genome and it is uh, getting out towards the plasma membrane for assembly. And the red is the nice filamentous microtubule network. If you disrupt it with nacodazole, which is a drug that disrupts the microtubules, you can see on the bottom, the, uh, the, network, the nice network is gone. And now the viral nucleoprotein is hung up in spots in the cell, and can't get to where it needs to be. So again, emphasizing the point that you need to move around in these cells by these pathways. Another general concept which is useful to think about is nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. And so viral components are often assembled in foci in the cell. They're not just put together all over the place randomly. And you can see these 
foci by light microscopy, uh, and we sometimes call them factories or inclusions. Here on the right is a neuron infected with rabies virus, and uh, in the middle is the nucleus. It's, it's not a healthy cell. You know, rabies infecting neurons makes it sick, but around in the cytosol, there are these darkly staining bodies, which would not be in the uninfected cell. Those are where the virus is assembling. And these were discovered years ago by an Italian pathologist named Negri. And so these are called Negri bodies. And in the old days, before PCR and other diagnostics, if you found these in the brain of someone, it was diagnostic for rabies. And similarly, in kids with measles, we can look in their mouth and find syncytia, which would be diagnostic for measles. But while it's diagnostic for infection, that's in fact where the virus is assembling because it is more efficient when you assemble in a discrete place in the cell. On the left is another example uh, of concentrating proteins on membranes for replication. When poliovirus and other plus and minus RNA viruses replicate, they replicate their genomes not floating around in the cytosol, but actually on membranes that they induce. Viral proteins induce the synthesis of membranes, and the RNA synthesis can occur on the surface or within them. And this is an example in a polio-infected cell. Now, these structures are double-membrane vesicles that are induced by infection. And all those little dots are, are mature polio particles, but the RNA synthesis occurs on the surface of these membranes, and that's, we think, to concentrate it. And there are many other examples of this, but the point is all these reactions we're going to talk about today happen in uh, very concentrated areas in the cell. Viral proteins have addresses just like uh, cell proteins do, membrane targeting signals, which we'll talk about today. They, they comprise signal sequences for crossing the ER, fatty acid modifications to embed them in membranes. And that's for proteins that need to go to a membrane. Uh, then we have membrane retention signals, so they stay in the membrane. We have nuclear localization signals, or NLSs, and two examples are shown here. This is a very simple one found in the T antigen of SV40. Remember, T antigen is made in the cytosol. It has to get in the nucleus to help viral DNA replication. And so this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven amino acid sequence, it's all you need to get that in the nucleus. It's recognized by the import machinery. And you can put that sequence in any protein and it will get it into the nucleus. And there are longer ones as well. And finally, there are signals to get proteins out of the nucleus, nuclear export signals. So a protein that needs to go in and then come back out again has to have both. And nucleic acids typically don't have these import and export sequences. To get in and out of the nucleus, nucleic acids have to bind a protein that has an import or an export signal. And here's an example of, of proteins getting localized to the nucleus. We've talked about a number of viruses, DNA viruses mainly, but some RNA, where the DNA replication is occurring in the nucleus and the proteins to make new particles have to go in there. So polyomavirus, SV40, the uh, subunits for the caps that are made in the cytosol, they get put in the nucleus and eventually assembled. They have a nuclear import sequence. Uh, the adenovirus hexon, a parvovirus capsid also has to go in, capsid proteins. And even the influenza virus nuclear protein, the nuclear protein is going to go in and coat the newly made RNAs in the nucleus. Flu is unusual among RNA viruses in that its RNA is replicated in the nucleus. So all those proteins have to have nuclear localization signals. Likewise, many glycoproteins of viruses get targeted to the plasma membrane. And so they typically are synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They have signal sequences that embed them uh, in the membrane and retain them there so they don't go all the way through. They're retained in the membrane. And then they're typically transported to the plasma membrane by the uh, secretory pathway where vesicles pinch off the ER, they pass through the stacks of the Golgi, they're transported to the plasma membrane, uh, again on microtubules, and then they fuse, these vesicles fuse, and then they, the proteins are displayed on the plasma membrane. That's eventually where the virus particle is going to form, and we'll see that today. Now, a key concept in making a new virus particle is the idea of a subassembly. It's like an automobile assembly line. 
right? The, the, the nascent auto goes down the assembly and people add parts to it. This is an efficient way to make something. We didn't invent it, so viruses do it. And um, if you make a mistake, you can take the part out. So here's a subassembly concept. And again, it's formation of discrete intermediates for a bacteriophage, which is eventually going to look like that. It's a tailed uh, bacteriophage with an icosahedral capsid. You make all the parts individually. So the individual proteins are made, and they have numbers for names. So like the tails are assembled in one part, and the icosahedral head is assembled, and those two are put together. And of course, if you make a mistake in the tail or the head, you can reverse it and start again. Uh, and then the tail fibers are made separately, and they're attached as well. So you get orderly formation of the virus particles, and it gives you quality control. So these steps don't go further unless everything is right. So if, if the um, tail isn't made right, it won't participate in being attached to the head and so forth. So subassemblies happen. And here are three ways that subassemblies are made in infected cells. Uh, on the top are some examples of making them from individual protein molecules. So here, is the, uh, here are two subunits of the SV40 pentamer which there are 72 that make up the viral capsid. It's VP1 and VP2 slash 3. They're made separately. They assemble. Their, their structure allows them to assemble spontaneously into the pentamer. That's a subassembly because it's not the whole virus particle. It's quite obvious. In the middle, sometimes you have polyprotein precursors. We encountered polyproteins being made by translation of some viral genomes. Here's poliovirus where the capsid protein is translated as a long polyprotein, and then the bonds between the individual capsid proteins are cleaved by proteinases, and that gives you the structural unit. So the structural unit of which there are five around the five-fold axis of symmetry. And then finally, uh, we know that chaperones are needed to help these proteins fold properly, so these are complicated folding reactions. Here's an example with the uh, hexon where in this case, you know, the hexon is a trimer of a single protein, and there is a viral protein called the 100 kilodalton L4, which is a, actually a chaperone that helps this monomer assemble into trimers. And there are also examples of cellular chaperones as well on this slide, for example. Here are some assembly reactions assisted by cellular proteins that act as chaperones. At the top, we're looking at the assembly of a retrovirus capsid. There's no membrane here. This is just the inner part of the capsid. This will make more sense later, I think. But in the final product, we have uh, the RNA brought in and uh, a couple of other proteins, capsid and, and uh, matrix protein forming the capsid. But this starts out as a, a, a single polypeptide, GAG, and there's a cellular chaperone called TRIC that helps with this entire assembly process. If you take out TRIC, uh, this doesn't go properly. And there are a number of cleavages here and assembly of mu multiple subunits. So you can see the GAG protein consists of a series of structural proteins, which we'll see later in more detail, and those get assembled in individual units. After this virus buds, it all get cleaved. It gets cleaved to liberate the single polypeptides, which is, happens after budding. But again, a chaperone is needed for that. And the incorporation of the polyomavirus pentamer, which we looked at before, into virus particles uh, depends on a cellular chaperone called HSC70, along with uh, large T, which also provides chaperoning. This protein does everything, right? It's a origin binding protein transcriptional stimulator, turns on cellular DNA synthesis, and it's a chaperone as well. So those are some examples of assembly steps assisted by chaperones. In general, assembly occurs in one of two ways. It can occur in a sequence of steps or it can happen all at once, which is typically when a virus buds, the whole thing is put together. So here's an example of sequential capsid assembly with poliovirus. So we're actually starting at the beginning of the infectious cycle. The RNA is in the cell. We're producing the individual proteins. The structural protein is shown there. Uh, this assembles into pentamers, and then the, the genomic RNA binds the pentamer. The pentamer is five copies of that 5S structural unit. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, 12 pentamers assemble to form uh, the virus particle, and it undergoes a final cleavage of uh, VP0 to make it infectious. So it's, it's a sequential assembly because you make this 5S structural unit from translation and cleavage of the polyprotein to assemble into pentamers and then virus particles. And I think we have another one here, sequential capsid assembly, which has an interesting twist. This is herpes virus capsid assembly. So this is actually the nucleocapsid. In the end, this is the capsid with the DNA, and it will eventually acquire a membrane. So this is just the nucleocapsid assembling in the nucleus. And so the DNA replicates in the nucleus, as we saw previously. And the structural proteins are all imported. And this is a complicated and large capsid. So there are pentamers and hexamers. And then there are these other proteins listed. OK, there's a portal. There's one portal below there, UL6. And then there are all these other proteins which serve as scaffolds. And so a protein scaffold is assembled. And on that, the uh, pentamers and hexamers are put down. Because apparently, it's too big to just put them together on their own. It's like a building. You have to put a scaffold on the outside. Well, here the scaffold's on the inside. And when the particle is complete, one of these proteins has a protease as part of it. The protease is activated, and it digests away the scaffold, takes the scaffold off the building, and then the genomic DNA goes in through the portal in a reaction we'll look at later. So this is quite interesting, because as you get bigger and bigger, you have to add other steps to assemble. Things don't just assemble spontaneously. And here you need a scaffold to stabilize this. And apparently, when you put DNA in it, that helps to stabilize it as well. So the scaffolding proteins give you intermediates, but they're transient. And the proteases that are packaged become activated to uh, finalize this structure, if you will. So that's sequential assembly. It's very simple in concept. Right? Now we're going to look at concerted assembly. Now what we mean here is that the particles assemble only in association with the viral genome. So you don't make a particle and put the DNA in like we did with herpes virus. Here, the particles assemble uh, when we make the genome part of it. So here's influenza virus. The RNA is replicated in the nucleus. And so we have eight segments. And they're each replicating. And they're joined with protein in the nucleus. And they're exported as a ribonucleoprotein. And this, this structure goes from the nuclear export all the way to the plasma membrane on microtubules. They're not drawn here. And at the same time, glycoproteins are being synthesized in the ER. They're transported up via vesicles to the plasma membrane. You see the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase are inserted in there. And that ribonucleoprotein then binds the area of the plasma membrane where these glycoproteins are being inserted, and the whole structure begins to bud out in a process we'll look at later. And so that's concerted, because we make the particle all at one time when the genome is becoming associated with the glycoproteins. So the budding is, is really the final step in assembly, and what comes off is a mature particle. And so the process of this, this piece of membrane moving out and then pinching off, that's what we call budding. I want to just look a little closer at the HA to give you a sense of how this works, because as you know, all enveloped viruses have glycoproteins in their membrane, uh, no matter which one, from the herpes viruses, influenza, coronaviruses, anything with a membrane. And the influenza virus has two uh, glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. And the hemagglutinin attaches to the receptor. And we're, this will play a big role later when we talk about uh, pathogenesis and preventing infection. And we'll talk about the role of the neuraminidase as well, which is an enzyme. But the hemagglutinin, remember, is a trimer perpendicular to the viral membrane with a globular head. And that's where the sialic acid binding site is. Uh, and it is shown below in a linear diagram to show how it's assembled. And we'll look at how it, it's made in a moment. But here's the viral membrane. There's a little piece of the protein in the interior of the virus particle. And we have a transmembrane segment. And then the rest is outside of the virus. And there at the very end terminus is the signal sequence that gets this through the secretory pathway. Uh, 
Uh, this protein is glycosylated, so each of these Ys is a sugar moiety attached to it. And that, of course, happens during transit through the ER and Golgi. There are a number of disulfide bonds, as you can see here, and they maintain the overall structure in part. But a key part of this is the fusion peptide, which is in here in the middle. Remember, this fusion peptide during entry will insert into the endosome membrane. But in the precursor of HA, it's buried and has to be cleaved at that arrowhead by a protease. And that protease can be in the infected cell or it could be outside of the infected cell. Well, that has enormous consequences for the pathogenesis of these viruses. We'll talk about that later. And so the, the fusion peptide ends up being buried near the base of the HA molecule, and it has to be cleaved in order for the virus to infect the cell. If the right protease isn't present, the virus will not infect cells. And we think that for most uh, strains of flu, the right protease is in our lungs, and that's what restricts the virus to lungs. This new coronavirus has, appears to have a cleavage sequence in a similar place for the fusion peptide that can be cleaved by ubiquitous proteases in many tissues and may, may explain why it can replicate at different sites. So this protein is initially produced in the ER. So there's a ribosome translating the HA mRNA. The signal se sequence brings it uh, into the endoplasmic reticulum. And there on the right is a, is a blow up of what the final protein looks like when it's passed through the membrane, the little membrane, a transmembrane sequence. And there's a a lipid attached to the C-terminus of the protein that anchors it on the inside of the virus particle. And here's the, the exterior part of the HA. And this is uncleaved still, so we call it HA0. And then it moves through the Golgi, through the various stacks. And in the Golgi, it oligomerizes, so three, three of the monomers come together. The sugars are trimmed. n acetyl glucosamine is added, galactose, sialic acid, so forth as it moves through. Uh, the trans-Golgi network, and then eventually, at the very last parts of the Golgi, you have the final protein. It can be cleaved at this point. There are proteases in the Golgi of some cells that can cleave it. Not the influenza viruses that we typically get, though. Uh, they're, they're cleaved by extracellular proteases, so these would end up not being cleaved. But eventually, they go. these vesicles will bring them to the plasma membrane, and there they're available for budding. And that's just one example of a typical membrane glycoprotein, what it has to go through to get to the plasma membrane. So here we have a question. Subassemblies are involved in which of the following types of virus particle production? Concerted assembly, sequential assembly, assembly lines, chaperone-assisted assembly, or all of the above? Most of you got all of the above, which is the right answer. All of these things are um, part of sub or what subassemblies are involved in. Subassemblies can be part of concerted or sequential assembly. It's just a matter of making, taking one protein and making a bigger assembly out of it and so forth. It's also uh, on assembly lines and chaperone assisted assembly. So all of the above. So those are, those are the general concepts on making a particle. Now, the next thing, of course, we, we have to consider, which is very important, is getting the genome into the particle. The real key here is that only, you only want to package viral genomes, not cellular nucleic acids, right? That would be a complete waste of time, unless it's a tRNA for a retrovirus, then, of course, you need to put that in. But you wouldn't have, want to have a cellular mRNA in place of a poliovirus genome. It's got to be distinguished in the cytosol for, for viruses that replicate there and in the nucleus for viruses that replicate there, distinguishing viral DNA from cellular DNA or RNA. And the solution is packaging signals, discrete sequences in viral RNA or DNA that specify interaction with the structural proteins of the virus particle. So let me give you some examples of how this works. That, by the way, is budding of a retrovirus. This, so we're just finishing up the fifth edition of the textbook, and we have a lot of new figures. And this one, it's not gonna come out till September, so it's too late for you, but uh, this is a new retrovirus budding. So we have a new retrovirologist on the team, and she changed a lot of the figures. So that's a retrovirus budding. And so here that you can see the, the RNA is in green, 
and uh, it's associating with the nucleocapsid protein of each of these proteins. So this blue, red, yellow is a gag fusion protein. It's not yet cleaved. It's, it's a couple of proteins together, and obviously the yellow one is the nucleic acid binding part. And, and this is beautiful. Look what she did. Every so often, you have gag and Paul pulled into the particle. The Paul, of course, is the RT in the integrase. And so it's pulled in as a fusion protein with gag. And then when this matures, the next step after this, which isn't shown here, you have, you have budding. And then the next step, the protease, which is part of this precursor, is going to cleave all these proteins and change the shape of the core and make the final so this is an example of a virus that matures after it buds, but we'll take a look at that later. But I wanted to show you that this RNA is interacting specifically with the nucleocapsid protein by packaging signals, and that's what pulls it into the virus particle. It's a nice, nice illustration of that. So here are some packaging signals of DNA genomes, and on the top is adenovirus, serotype 5, that doesn't matter, it's just one that's studied a lot. And of course, that's a double-stranded DNA genome. And this is the left end. There's one of the origins. There's the inverted terminal repeat. And on the right here is the E1A promoter. That's the first promoter to, to work and make E1A that frees up E2F. Uh, but here in between the, the end and the E1A, there are pa packaging sequences in the blue bars. There are a bunch of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven discrete sequences. And you can disrupt those and the DNA won't get into the particle. So these are interacting with structural proteins to bring it in. And of course, these sequences are not present in cellular nucleic acids. So the cellular nucleic acids are not packaged. If you want to make a vector and deliver a therapeutic gene to people who need it, and we're going to talk about this at the end, you have to make sure you have the packaging sequences in the vector. Otherwise, you'll never get your gene in a virus particle. So all the therapeutic use of viruses that we're going to talk about depends on a lot of basic molecular biology that people did for many years and not really understanding where it was going. So people identified these packaging sequences in the 70s and 80s before people started to do gene therapy. And they did it just because they were interested in it. And now it turns out to be useful. All right, so that's ADNO. Here's another example, SV40. Uh, there's the origin of DNA replication there. That's the top of the circle DNA, if you will. So that's the early transcription to the right. Late would be to the left. It's also the origin of DNA synthesis, of course. And uh, on here, these bars are actually transcription factor binding sites, SP1 transcription factor. But the, the packaging sequence overlaps with those. So this is a very complicated region of the genome. It's got the Promoter, the origin is packaging, transcription factors, enhancers, and so forth. This is a compact genome, so you have to have a lot in one place. But again, those are absolutely necessary for packaging. And so for adenovirus, the way this works is you make a capsid first in the nucleus, and then you thread viral DNA into the capsid, and only DNA with the packaging sequence will get into the capsid, and then the whole genome is, is threaded in there. So you have these packaging si signals. They're pretty complicated, as you can see here. There are lots of them. In, in adenovirus, they're recognized by this protein, 4A2, uh, which is part of the capsid, and they help get the DNA inside. So that's a general principle. The packaging signals are recognized by structural proteins, and that's how they get into the virus particle. And here's how herpes does it. This is quite interesting. Remember that herpes DNA replication occurs by rolling circle, right? So the genome is linear in the virus particle, which is shown in panel A. But when it gets in the nucleus, it's circularized, and then it's nicked, and then the DNA begins to replicate as a rolling circle shown there in the upper left. And you get very, very long DNA made that contains multiple genomes in it. Catamers, that's what those are called. And each of those, and they can be very, very long. This occurs in the nucleus, of course. And they have signals that are going to get them into particles. And those are shown here on the left end, where it's exposed. And you have direct repeat one, you have direct repeat two, and then PAC1 and PAC2. PAC stands for packaging. These are the packaging signals. And what happens is, in the nucleus, where the DNA is replicating, it's very long. So you're going to have this packaging area repeated every 
every genome, if the genome is 200 KB, it's going to be every 200 KB. And you assemble a capsid, which we saw previously. You put a scaffold inside, then capsid forms, you digest it. And then the DNA attaches to, a, to the portal. There's only one per particle. There's the portal right there. And there are a number of proteins that associate with the DNA via these sequences that are listed here, PACs and DRs. And those also interact with the portal. So the portal recognizes viral DNA only. It binds to it. Part of the portal is a motor that pulls in the DNA. Right, so these are called packaging motors. They're called motors because they, they ratchet the DNA inside. And you can see this is happening here. It's an energy dependent process. And it keeps pulling the DNA in. So when it starts, there's one of this little um, stripy box here is the set of packaging sequences at the one end of the genome. And so that is pulled in. And then the rest of the genome is put in. And then when the whole genome is in, that will bring another packaging signal near the portal or at the portal. And there, the whole thing is cut. And it's cut right in between so you don't get a duplicated packaging sequence. And you end up having a full genome in the capsid. And then what remains can go and get incorporated into another capsid. So the packaging sequences recognize the portal. The portal pulls the DNA in. And then there's an endonuclease that cuts it. And in the particle, it, is, it's, it ends up linear, of course. So this is pretty cool because these motors are very prevalent in the virus world. Lots of phages have them. And they actually put the DNA in the particle at hundreds of pounds of pressure, like 900, for some phages, the DNA is packed in under 900 PSI, pounds per square inch. And so when they, those phages poke a hole in the bacterium, the DNA just comes shooting out. And it has to because the bacterium is under pressure. And without that pressure in the phage, it wouldn't be able to get in there. And some of these viruses also package DNA under high pressure as well. Remarkably high, 900, that's a lot of pounds of pressure. So that's, our, that's DNA. These are some RNA packaging signals. I'm going to show you two. This one is a retrovirus packaging signal. It happens to be HIV-1. And the left end of the genome is shown down here at the bottom in green. So there's uh, the first base on the left. There's no cap shown, but this would be capped. There's the primer binding site. Remember that where the tRNA would be binding. And so right in here, there is a packaging sequence. We call these psi sequences, right? PSI, the P packaging, I suppose. And so this, you, you have to have this for the RNA to be packaged. It turns out it's necessary, but not sufficient. There are some other sequences you need as well. So it's a little complicated. There are some retroviruses where this is all you would need to package any RNA into the capsid. And above it is shown the structure of this RNA. And you can see it's highly folded. And again, from this part here, this is the AUG that initiates uh, the first, the gag protein, actually. From there, all the way to the left, that is the packaging sequence structured. And it also has this kissing loop where it forms a dimer between two RNAs. The kissing loop is complementary in, in two uh, RNAs. And it forms the, this kissing loop shown at the top, which is what brings two RNAs into the particles. So the packaging sequence interacts with the nucleocapsid protein to get it, to get the RNA in the particle, and then the kissing sequence brings two molecules in. And that's shown here. Here's the, here's the structure of the protein. And this is the uh, C terminus of the GAG protein here, the nucleocapsid. You also have matrix and capsid. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at, at that later. And the nucleocapsid is the RNA binding protein. And it has sequences that allow it to bind. It has high plus charged amino acids, which is good for binding a negatively charged uh, nucleic acid and specific uh, binding sequences. And so this protein binds the RNA. And that's diagrammed here on the lower right. So that you have our two RNAs that are joined by the kissing loop, right? And then the nucleocapsid protein is the uh, white sphere. I guess it's blue here. And this is binding uh, the packaging sequence. This is matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid, 
and the, the nucleocapsid is binding the RNA. And eventually, these are all going to line up at the membrane and pull the RNA with it. So I think you can see how the RNA is binding the nucleocapsid, and then the RNA-RNA interactions make sure that you have two in there. Because you can imagine that if there were no way for these RNAs to interact, one could be pulled by one set of proteins and another by, and they would never get two into a particle. It would be very hard to do that. So that's an example of a RNA genome packaging sequence. Now, for segmented viruses, this is a really interesting problem because HIV, they're the two genomes, it's diploid, remember, and they, they are both brought in by this kissing loop. But what about a virus like influenza virus where you have eight segments and you have to get all eight into a particle because if you don't, it won't be infectious. And so people thought originally that they were just packaged randomly that the virus particle grabbed eight RNAs from the cytosol, and sometimes you got the right eight, and sometimes you got the wrong eight. Uh, but the particle to PFU ratio is actually consistent with a random mechanism. It's uh, one in 400 influenza particles made in a cell are infectious. And if you do the math, selecting eight random segments from a pool actually would give you roughly that. However, there's, there's evidence that it's not just random. There are actually specific packaging sequences on each RNA segment. So let's see how that works. So the first clue about what was going on here was when you, when you do an electron micrograph of influenza particles, the RNA segments are always arranged in parallel in these particles. And so this picture on the lower left, these are a bunch of influenza virus particles. And they're spherical, right? You can see that each of these dots is actually an RNA segment pointed towards you out of the screen. These have kind of been sliced optically. And they are always oriented in parallel. And in fact, when these viruses bud, as you can see in the top image, the segments, which are shown in green, red, orange, and blue, they're always in parallel. So that was the first clue that there was some kind of interaction between the segments. And then people started to look at the sequences at the end of the RNA segments. Here, here are the eight RNAs shown at this bottom image, encoding the various proteins. And you'll recognize the HA and the uh, NA and the nuclear protein and so forth. But there are conserved sequences at the ends of these RNAs that apparently have packaging signals in them that specify not only interaction with proteins in the particle, so RNA protein interactions, but RNA RNA, so that you get all of the right eight. And you can move these sequences around among the different segments and they will still work. So the HA signal can be swapped with a, another one and that other gene will still get in as long as you have all eight. So that's what we think is going on here. This combination of these RNA sequences in each segment, they're slightly different. So they specify not only protein interaction, but also RNA. RNA interaction. And we think this probably is the case for many segmented RNA viruses, but there is one other mechanism that works and is known to work for segmented viruses, and that's called selective packaging. And this is where you put one segment in first, and then the second one depends on the first being there, and the third depends on the second one being there. So this is a bacteriophage uh, where this is been discovered bacteriophage Phi6. It has three double-stranded RNA segments, the small, medium, and the large. And you can see the structure there. It's got a double shell, very much like real viruses. And there in, in the interior are the, the three double-stranded RNA segments, the big one, the medium, and the little one. And this packaging is serially dependent. In other words, S always goes in first, probably sequences on S interacting with a structural protein of the particle. And then M goes in next, probably by interacting with sequences on S, and then L, always in that order, S, M, L. And as a consequence, the particle to PFU ratio of these viruses is one. I shouldn't say as a consequence, but it's consistent with it doing it right all the time, right? So with flu, maybe there's some wiggle room and they get it wrong sometimes, but here it's one, to one, every particle is infectious, and maybe because the, the segments always get put in in a certain order. So that's quite interesting. Selective packaging. Next question is, packaging signal on viral what? 
interact with viral what during virus assembly. So we have two words we have to put in. We can choose lipids, proteins, proteins subassemblies, genomes, proteins, proteases, membranes, or proteins, genomes. All right, so look at the sentence structure. Packaging signals. You got to know where the packaging signal is to put that right word in there. Okay, let's see how we did here. All right, so most of you got genomes, proteins. The packaging signal is on the genome, so you could get that one right away. And then viral proteins, the, the structural proteins, is what the packaging signals interact with. So you either you pick that or E, which was the same thing reversed, but the packaging signal is on the RNA or DNA, okay? So you will forever remember that, right? All right, then the last step for some viruses is to acquire an envelope. And remember now, some viruses are already going to be made by the assembly pathways we've looked at. You have an icosahedral shell. We've put the nucleic acid in, and it just has to get out of the cell. But there's, for many viruses, there's a step of acquiring an envelope. And this can happen in two ways. After assembly of internal structures is the most common, then they butt out, and or simultaneous with assembly. So the retroviruses, uh, as they're budding, it's being cleaved and formed. And this can happen, this is driven by different components of virus particles. And it's shown by these four different categories here. So in, in some cases, and I'm going to start with three because uh, I think that's really neat. Just the envelope protein alone is enough to, to drive budding. And what that means is if I take the gene for the flu HA and put it in an insect cell, it will make particles. It will drive the budding of particles with the, with the HA in them. And it'll work in plants. And in fact, there's an, there's an HA-based plant vaccine being trialed that does just that. We just put the HA in plants, and you get particles. And there's no nucleic acid inside. There's just HA. But it's, it's a safe vaccine, and they're being tested in people. So that's the envelope protein can do it. Uh, sometimes the capsid plus the envelope are needed for some viruses. Sometimes internal proteins like the matrix protein, which is a protein that's often found underneath the membrane. It gives it some structure. That alone is enough to drive it. And retroviruses, the, the matrix or the capsid. So for retroviruses, you can just produce the gag protein in cells, and that will make particles without envelope if you don't have envelope present. And we'll, we'll look at that when we make retrovirus vectors. And then the fourth one is the matrix does it, but you need some other components and to make it more efficient. And so that's VSV there. And we um, usually make VSV vectors with multiple components as a consequence of that. But in either case, this, these envelope proteins are driving the budding. And so let's look at that one more time for influenza virus. Uh, here we have deposition of HA and NA. And the um, ribonucleoprotein, of course, you need eight of these to interact. And this is just showing one for simplicity. We'll look in a moment on how this RNP knows to go here. That's an interesting problem. Why does it go there and not somewhere else? Uh, and then this process, we will also see how it triggers the formation of a bud. And then that pinches off to form uh, the virus particle. So let's talk about membrane targeting sequences. And so we're going to look at influenza virus here and VSV. So the M1 protein is this blue shell underneath the membrane. So M1 is a small protein. There are many of them making up this shell. And it has to go uh, to the membrane here. So M here gets targeted to the membrane because it has a membrane binding region. So there's the M protein. It has a nuclear export and a nuclear import sequence. It's made in the cytoplasm. It goes in the nucleus. So we have a hydrophobic region here, lipid binding and membrane binding. That allows the M protein to bind to the membrane. And then the, there's another part of the protein that binds the RNA. So you can see these blue M proteins are binding the RNA via this sequence. And the other part is binding the membrane. So that's how they are. Targeted. Of course, they're brought down here by microtubules and they bind the membrane. And there's a similar situation for the VSV M protein, which has the same structural role in the particle. Uh, and then we have membrane binding regions like here 
where it targets the, this protein to the membrane and also binding to RNP. So in both of these proteins, we have specific amino acids that bind the membrane and the viral RNP. And here's the situation for retroviruses. So here's the whole thing happening. And this is very cool. Now we've got the final particle made there. You can see how it changes. It matures outside of the cell. But let's back up. So here we have the proviruses in this cell, and it's being transcribed, and full-length mRNAs are coming out. That's the RNA genome there. And some of those RNA are translated to make the GAG protein. And the GAG is matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, and P6. And that's blue, red, yellow, green. Blue, red, yellow, green. So they're still joined at this point. They're not separated proteolytically. The nucleocapsid will bind the RNA, and the matrix, by virtue of its membrane binding sequence, will bring it up to the membrane. As you can see there, there are a whole bunch of these uh, GAG proteins lined up, and they're pulling in two RNAs, just pull in two RNAs per particle. Sometimes the GAG, when, when the RNA is translated, there's a, there's a termination codon after P6. Sometimes that is suppressed Translational suppression, so it's the stop codon is translated, so you make a gag pol fusion protein. And now you have not only matrix capsid NCP6, but you have ART protease and reverse transcriptase and integrase. And so a few of these get incorporated. You see here there's two, one, two, three, four, five. The whole thing. So you don't need a lot of RT and integrase per particle. It's an enzyme. You don't need it in tons like they need the structural proteins. And so those get pulled in, then this assembly buds out, and then that protease cleaves all these bonds, MACA, NC, RT, integrase, and you have the mature protein where you have now a capsid form, and then you have the free reverse transcriptase and integrase and protease. So even the protease doesn't come in with every gag, it comes only in with the gag pol because it's that white, molecule there. You don't need to have a protease with every gag precursor. You just need one or two per particle to cleave it. All right, so that is uh, illustrating maturation post budding. It's also illustration of how the RNA gets pulled in and how you pull in enough reverse transcriptase and enzymes. So the RT, protease RT and integrase, they're all enzymes, so you need a few of those per particle. All right, now we're going to look at this protein to see what makes it go to the membrane. Yes, here we go. So now I've shrunk the kids. No, I've shrunk the cell. And uh, there is, this is the same thing as the previous one, but here now we've taken matrix capsid NC P6. And the matrix has a number of signals that allow it to go to the membrane. So it will join where the glycoprotein is. It has a meristate. state at its end terminus. And state is a lipid that's often covalently joined to the end terminus of proteins, in some cases to target them to membranes. And this MA, if you take it off, if you take off the state, which you can do by changing the glycine that it's attached to, then you will not get virus particles. There's also on the matrix a membrane bound, binding area that has uh, positively charged amino acids, which will nicely interact with the negatively charged phospholipids of the membrane. And then the precursor also contains NC, which binds RNA. And I already showed you this, but this NC has specific RNA binding sequences. So that's why it grabs RNA. The uh, matrix brings the whole thing to the membrane, whether it's a GAG or a gag pol assembly. And that's how all those proteins get there. And um, it triggers budding. So you may wonder how the budding works, and we're going to actually look at that. But first, meristoylation, that's meristate right there in yellow. And here's the rest of the protein. It's typically linked to a glycine. And this allows you to target the proteins to membranes. And you don't need a signal sequence, right? Because in the ER, you need a signal sequence to go through. But in a cytosol, you would need something else, and that can be meristate. And so these are made in the cytosol. They're not made on rough membranes. And they're modified after translation by the addition of meristate. All right, so now how does budding work? So this goes back many years uh, to people who were making changes in this GAG protein. So we have two here, HIV or a mouse retrovirus, uh, 
Remember, matrix, capsid, NC, P6. I kind of cryptically mentioned P6. I didn't say anything about it. And in fact, in the, in the HIV, it's P6. In, in the mouse retrovirus, there's P12 in the between matrix and capsid. And people didn't know what these did, so they started changing the amino acids to see if they could find a phenotype in the virus. And what they found were these interesting particles. On the upper left is an electron micrograph of virus-infected cells where you have amino acid changes in P6. And the viruses never leave the cell. They end up sticking to the cell on these stalks. Membrane tethers, I think you can see that quite nicely. So you make a change in P6. And so that started the field on a road to discovering that these proteins, P6 and P12, interact with a cell machinery that's needed for budding. And they have since these signals, these binding signals, uh, you can see they're different here, PSTAP, et cetera, they're all consensus amino acid sequences are found in a whole range of envelope viruses, not every one, but in many, we call them late domains because they are responsible for a late function which is budding in the cell of the virus coming out of the cell. And they bind to members of the escort family of proteins which are shown here. And we have escort one, we have escort two, we have escort three, endosomal sorting complex for trans required for transport. That's what it stands for. And that escort all those escort family members are involved in membrane scission events in the cell. So when a cell divides into two, escort proteins are involved in making the scission and breaking it off. When there's vesicular traffic within a cell, either endosomal traffic or membranes going out, the escort pathway is involved. And so what have viruses done? They have proteins which bind the escort pathway and direct them to the surface where they then force budding. And so here we see interaction of the escort proteins with P6 or P12, which is in the virus particle. And that, that brings the escort machinery to the growing virus bleb. It pinches off and allows the virus to leave. Uh, and so that's why these proteins are present, to, to recruit the escort pathway and allow budding to occur. So that's the last step that we have to deal with. A couple of other things to just to end up, uh, viral glycoproteins, we've talked about them going to the plasma membrane, but actually they can go to any membrane in the cell. And here are examples of that. Herpes simplex glycoproteins can go to the nuclear membrane. Coronaviruses, flaviviruses, and others can be put in the ER. And, and this is where budding can occur. I'll show you that in a moment. Other viruses can be targeted to the Golgi, and of course to the plasma membrane, which we've already showed you. So the point here is that every membrane can be a site for budding, but it's always consistent within the family of viruses. So an influenza virus will always bud at the cell surface. All right, uh, what statement about budding is incorrect, viral budding. The envelope can be acquired before or simultaneous with assembly. The spike can drive budding. No host proteins are involved in budding. Lipids assist structural proteins to interact with the membrane. The viral membrane can be acquired from the nucleus ER, Golgi, or plasma membrane. Which one is wrong? Uh, no host proteins are involved. That's wrong. Escort pathway proteins are involved in budding. Everything else is right. Now, let me, let me tell you about herpes virus egress. So here we start in the nucleus on the left and the viral capsids are assembled and they bud out of the nucleus. So that's shown here, the capsid, it's budding out and now it's in the ER, so it has a membrane. And these are nice EMs which show each of these stages. And then to get out of the ER, the membrane fuses and now we have the nuclear capsid in the cytoplasm. That's not good. Okay, so what does it do then? It attaches to the trans-Golgi and buds into it. <laughs> and if Good for it, it doesn't fuse out of the trans-Golgi, it actually buds again out, so now it's in a vesicle. So this is the actual virus particle in a vesicle. The vesicle is part of the vesicular transport pathway, it goes to the surface, it fuses and releases the virus. So the, the, the membrane that 
is on the particle actually comes from here, from the trans-Golgi, because it loses the nuclear membrane. So this is an example of being able to acquire a membrane at the trans-Golgi. Flavi viruses are assembled in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and they bud out, and then they pass through uh, the trans-Golgi, and they move as a virus particle uh, to the surface, in a vesicle, the vesicle then fuses. So this, this particle is actually has an envelope beneath the capsid protein. So what comes out is envelope, but you can't tell because the spike glycoproteins are obscuring it. But as this is moving through, the, uh, the trans-Golgi changes in pH. So the ER is about 7.2, then it slowly drops. And that's important for the maturation of this virus. And this will bring you back to entry. So the, these particles in the ER, they're immature. The spike glycoproteins are sticking up. And remember, when this attaches to a cell, they're flat on the particle. And low pH makes them stick up. So this is not good. And they also have this blue protein uh, hiding the fusion protein. So it's not the fusion peptide. So it's not fusing within the, the cell. As the pH drops, the conformation of this uh, spike moves down. It flattens on the membrane. And that's the way it is in the particle. And then. Uh, there are furin proteases in the uh, trans-Golgi, and they cleave off the blue protein here. And then when the virus particle moves out of the cell, these bits of blue called PR, they, they are lost. So that's the mature virus particle. And now the fusion peptide is hidden because the glycoprotein is pushed down on the membrane. And we always talk about spring-loaded glycoproteins, right? Low pH in this case would make this pop up and the fusion protein would go into the membrane. So during assembly, you have to make sure that that's not happening because there is low pH in here. So you cover it with this particular protein. The last things I want to talk about very briefly are leaving the cell. When you bud from the surface, you're free, but vaccinia virus has an interesting way of doing this. And vaccinia virus forms in the cytosol. Remember, it's replicating there, reproducing there. It has two membranes. And here we're seeing, this is called an intracellular envelope virion. It's being brought up to the plasma membrane on a microtubule. It then, the outer membrane fuses at the plasma membrane. So now you have a cell-associated envelope virion. And that interacts with proteins, receptors on the cell surface that start a signaling pathway through SARC involving phosphorylation. And all of that triggers actin polymerization which essentially pushes the virus away from the cell into the next cell. So these actins are driven, their assembly is driven by virus hitting receptors on the cell surface. And in cell culture, you can see the virus being driven to the neighboring cell. Here's some, e, some fluorescent photos showing that. Here are these actin protrusions in green and the virus particles are at the tips. And in an electron micrograph, you can see the actin microfilaments there with the virus particle at the tip. So that's a really cool way of not just depending on diffusion, but actually pushing the virus to another cell. Now, all the experiments that have led to the work, the conclusions I've talked about today were done in cell culture. But when we talk about infecting people, we're typically talking about infecting tissues of various sorts with different structures. And in your respiratory and alimentary and other mucosal tracts, you have uh, epithelial cells. And uh, viruses can bud out of them and be free and move around the organism. But they can also move from cell to cell. So they can bud at the area between cells and immediately fuse into the next one and start a new infection. We call that cell to cell spread. And that can happen throughout your respiratory tract. So you could have a virus infecting your upper tract, and it could spread cell to cell very deep down into your lung. So envelope viruses, pretty clear how they can get out of a cell. What about non-envelope viruses? Well, I showed you this picture a long time ago of poliovirus infecting cells in culture and basically lysing them. Many viruses kill cells and they break open and the viruses are released. Death can occur by apoptosis or necroptosis. Uh, many of these viruses encode proteins that induce rupture of the cell membranes. For example, viral porins make pores in infected cells, and the polyomaviruses go through them. And so the, the cell gets generally trashed, and that's our classical view of how a non-envelope virus gets out of cells. But we're beginning to learn now that there's some non-lytic mechanisms for release of these virus particles. Um, and, and this involves 
double membrane vesicles that are formed by autophagy. When a cell is stressed, when a virus is infecting it, that imposes stress on the cell. Uh, the virus makes autophagic va vacuoles, and these can be the sites of RNA replication in some cases, so the virus is using those, but late in the cycle, the virus particles can end up in these autophagosomes. So these autophagosomes are made by the cell to engulf contents of the cytoplasm and release it outside of the cell. So the cell is dying, let's share our cytoplasm with another cell. And so the virus particles can get trapped into those and be released along with the content. And we also now realize that some non-enveloped particles can be released in exosomes, which are little membrane vesicles that are continually released from many cells. They contain RNAs and proteins are involved in signaling and many other activities. Uh, they can contain virus particles. And so some viruses, which we have considered to be non-enveloped, end up in some cases having envelopes like these and you can actually detect them uh, in infected individuals. So we're starting to learn more about how non-envelope viruses leave cells. All right, next time we're gonna end the infectious cycle and, and take an overview of all the things that happen in an infected cell.